we believe that this message will be a blessing to you so I want you to stay glued and watch to the end and share to bless others this is Christocentric we have a lot of Apostle Eric Nyamiche's message on our platform kindly check them out thank you for watching stay blessed I want to discuss the topic raising family altars to strengthen the local church lessons from the puritans my intent is not to rush through this topic for i don't want to just teach about raising family altars but to touch on our marital relationship as well my greatest desire and endless prayer is that God will give us a compelling reason why we should pay attention to the family altar. And I am praying that that reason will be so infectious that it will have a generational effect in your home. To have a generational effect. And so you can go with me as we try to go through the scripts in your book. I'll try and take time, but I'll open up some portions that I need to open up. The agenda to possess the nations is aimed at transforming every sphere of society. Society with values and principles of the kingdom of God. So we are aiming at transforming society. To really bring transformation to society, there is the need to pay close attention to what goes on in homes or in our home. This is because the family remains the foundation or the bottom support of the society we seek to transform. So when we pay attention to the family, invariably, we may win the future. The society that is going to be produced in future, we may win it. And the family is also derived from marriage. That is why you can't talk about family when you also don't touch on marriage. The union between a biologically male species called man and a biologically female species called woman. A union between a man and a woman. Not any man, but a biologically male fellow. To possess the nations, therefore, there is a need for critical attention to be paid to the institution of marriage and the family life. Marriage is the oldest institution in the world. Marriage predates Christianity. Marriage came before even Christ was born. And Christ was born to a parent who were married. So God ordained marriage for humanity. God ordained marriage for humanity. In Genesis 18 to 24, 25. He saw that God gave the woman to the man to be the wife. And the Bible says that Adam and his wife, not Adam and that woman, Adam and his wife were both naked. They felt no shame. But this time Jesus was not born to begin Christianity. And then when Jesus arrived and there was a question on marriage, he said, in the beginning, it was no so. Then he referred to how God made Adam and Eve. That is where this institution of marriage actually started. A person does not necessarily have to be a Christian to experience successful or fulfilling marriage because it was made for all. You don't necessarily have to be a Christian to have a good marriage or a fulfilling marriage. All married couples living by the rules of love and understanding can make successful partners. All married couples. 
I was shocked with surprise when in my second station, our mission house was at the Zongo. And so I saw this man with the wives. You see the wives always working together. At least you see three, two, and sometimes the four. When we gave birth to our second, the four of them came to visit us. And then I was watching them talk and discuss. The friendliness amongst them, it is still there to today. When I visited Aguna and Sabah some couple of months back, one of them who saw me went to call the rest of them. This is polygamy. I'm not encouraging you. <laughs> I don't want your call to do polygamy. Yeah, but I just want you to know that if you live by certain principles, you can manage good relationship. That's all. But for us as Christians, marriage is a sign between Christ and the church. It speaks to us of the mystical union between Christ and the church. And one whose foundation is Christ himself. Success, or as a harmony between husband and wife, should therefore not be the only indicator for measuring Christian marriage and family life. Christian marriage and family life must also speak of the goodness of God. When two Christians walk to the altar to be joined in holy matrimony, heaven rejoices because their union is strategic and God's, God expects godliness and godly offspring from them. Your union is strategic. Heaven rejoices. At least heaven knows that in your hands, this child that is going to come out of the union is not going to be an arm robber. It shouldn't happen. You should be able to turn this one to Christ. So heaven rejoices. This calls for intentionality on the part of parents and guidance to raise these children and the entire household in the fear of God. One of the effective ways of doing that in raising godly children is by establishing family altars in Christian homes. To achieve this task, we have a great deal of lesson to learn from the life and times of the Puritans particularly on how they viewed marriage and family life. Who were they? The Puritans were members of a religious reform movement that arose within the Church of England in the late 16th century. They believed the Church of England was too similar to the Roman Catholic Church and should eliminate ceremonies and practices not rooted in scripture. Under siege from the church and the crown, that is the king, certain groups of the Puritans migrated to northern English colony in the New World. That those days the New World was the opening up of the Americas. They ran away in 1620, 1630s. And they laid the foundation for religious, intellectual, and social order of the New England. Aspects of Puritanism have reverberated throughout American life ever since. The name Puritan was a term of contempt assigned to the movement by its enemies because they were breakaways. The life of the Puritans was characterized with a strong quest for purity, hence the nickname Puritans. The Puritans also had a strong desire to pursue godliness, to reveal God in their, in their flesh, in all their endeavors, including marriage and family life. 
I shall now tend to establish a compelling reason why the family altar is important. Family life. The family is a crucial institution because it serves as the conduit or channel through which God blesses his people. The actions and inactions of a family is critical because it could cause God to release or withhold his blessings for them. I will expand on that soon. Malachi's contemporaries were distressed because God refused to accept their offerings by withholding his blessings from them. Malachi explains that God was acting as a witness against husbands who were unfaithful to their wives. Now, if, if he says God was acting as a witness, what does that mean? When we talk about a witness, or to witness is to see, to hear, and to know by personal presence. So, if you can lift your head now. When we say God is acting as a witness to the marital life, what that means is that God is personally present in the marriage. And he sees, he hears, and he knows. He doesn't need anybody to tell him what is going on in my marriage. He is personally present. He sees, he hears, and he knows. God knows what is going on between you and your wife. He knows what is going on between you and your husband. He knows. You can't hide anything. You can't. Let's go to Malachi chapter 2, from 13 through 16. Malachi 2, please. 13 through 16. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and, and will because he no longer pays attention to your offerings or accept them with pleasure from your hands. Now, God is not interested in offerings and pleasure from uh, people's hands. You see, God is interested in you. And when he's not interested in you, Things in your pocket and your hands, he doesn't like it at all. That is why the Bible says Cain and his offering, God did not like it. He didn't like Cain. So that was all. So what he, he was bringing was not something that God was going to take interest in. And so God was refusing the offerings because of the way some people have been treating their spouses. You ask why? It is because the Lord is acting as the witness, not a witness, the sole witness between you and the wife of your youth. When we are blessing marriages, we tend to say that, to witness that, at least when we are saying the vows. I call on all people here present to witness that. But after that, we go home. We go home. How many of you follow you into your house, checking what you are doing? We go. But the one who does not is God. The one who does not is God. It is because the Lord is acting as the witness, and the Lord is very important, the master, between you and the wife of your youth. Because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner, the wife of your married covenant. Has not the Lord made them one in flesh and spirit? They are his. Both of them are his. And why one? Why one? And why one? What is the answer to the why one? No, let's go back. Let's take the 14. You ask why. It is because the Lord is, is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. And you have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner. 
the wife of your married covenant. 15, please. Has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? What is the answer? Godly offspring. Godly offspring. So when I marry my wife, God is expecting godly offspring from me. If he grants us the grace to make children, godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit. Now, every marriage that wants to really succeed, you must guard yourself in your spirit. Guard yourself in your spirit. When certain things should not dis disturb the union, so put a guard on your spirit. Don't just say anything at all to your, to your wife or your husband. Your actions and inactions must be guarded because you don't have to disturb the union. Guard yourself in your spirit. And do not break faith with the wife of your youth. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. And I hate a man covering himself with violence as well as with his garment, says the Lord Almighty. So he goes back again to say, guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. When you have, you have to hold. And it is for better, for worse. In the new churches, they don't really say for better, for worse. They say for better, for better. As if the better for worse is a negative confession. Yeah. So it is for better, for better, for richer, for richer. Yeah. But life is not richer, for richer. Practically, life is not like that. <laughs> My wife was complaining of the hands. And then once she started complaining, I knew that the hand would be very painful because she would work so hard. And now she's complaining of the hands. I knew that that would be something. So one day she was sleeping. I went to the room. I said, Mary, Mary. Then she said, Minsa, I felt it. <laughs> Then I said, oh, Lord, so what is going on? Then all of a sudden, I felt some sharp pain in my hand. I said, oh, God, 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 because <laughs> I was afraid that that was going to be transferred to me. I said, hey, myself, I'm just asking what is happening. You see, but we should be able to share the pains we go through. Life is not for better, for better. When I was growing up as a Christian, I used to make a lot of noise. And the people thought that if you take Jesus from there, I am the next person. We were teenagers praying everywhere. Then I felt sick. I had some malaria. And I was taking some drugs. So this lady, this, I was just, this girl, those days we were just young, she came to my house. She was just a neighbor. And then when she got there, I was drinking some, taking some drug. And I said, hey, Brerick, do you also take medicine? Those days, uh, I couldn't say, I said, oh, wait, wait here, para, wait here, para. Whether it is para or, or tigerment, it is medicine. Life is not like that. Sometimes you're on top of the hill. Other times you may find yourself in the valley. But it doesn't mean that he has left you. That is why he says that when you are in the waters and in the fire, he said when, he didn't say if. So all of us may go through that. It makes even us better. I thank God for places where I served and there was no money. And God intentionally stayed his hand to teach me what it means to be in hardship. So that when you have plenty and somebody comes and says that I'm losing in revenue or I, I don't have what to eat, you understand. 
It makes your heart better, not your head. May God help all of us. So the above scripture suggests that marriage is a relationship between not just two persons, but how many? Three, the one who asks as the witness is always present. Marriage is a covenant, a three-way relationship in which the couple is accountable to God who acts as a witness in the marriage. God adds the spiritual dimension to the marital relationship and transforms the relationship into a powerhouse of strength when you allow him. And when you don't, you can suffer the troubles that come with the union. A generational blessing is guaranteed if the entire household is included in this relationship. So God comes in as the number three, but you and your husband or you and your spouse, as you say, bring the entire family into the relationship, then it will guarantee a generational blessing. This is well exemplified in the life of Jonathan Edwards. He lived for just 55 years in the 18th century. A clergyman and his wife, Sarah, who bequeathed a godly legacy to their 11 children and future descendants. I'm saying 11 because of the plentiful of the number, 11. I want to advise all of us that human beings are more precious than anything on earth. You can't purchase them with money. So if per adventure you fall pregnant and your children are six, don't kill the seventh one. Don't try to do that. The God who can take care of two can take care of 11. And we pastors should not be making sarcastic remarks at weddings and in our preaching. When you see a fellow with seven children, you don't be part of the people who say that when he is right for Uncle Kundia him. So don't be doing that. The human being is more precious than any other manufactured things we see. Shall we bow down our heads for a moment? What has gone on in the past? Where do we need to make some repentance? Can I give you some space to pray? Shall we pray? Making sarcastic remarks. Some people even want a baby, but they don't get. Some also have it plentiful. I'm not saying that give birth to numbers that you can take care of. But when it happens like that, you, the observer, don't be worried. And you too, don't torment yourself. You have not caused any evil. God will take care of your children. Amen. So he bequeathed a godly legacy to the, to the 11 children. At the turn of the 20th century, an American educator and pastor, A. E. Winship, decided to trace the descendants of Jonathan Edwards almost 150 years after his death. His findings were astounding. Now, these were some of the things he saw. Jonathan Edwards' descendants, one of them had be become U.S. vice president because they were Americans. Three U.S. senators three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents like the vice chancellor, 12 judges, 65 professors, 80 public officers, 100 missionaries, and that one is expected. The import of these outcomes is not necessarily the high social ladder Jonathan Edwards' descendants climbed or they keep climbing in the American society, but the foundation on which they stood or they stand 
on. This impressive achievement of the various generations of the Edwards family are traced to the Puritan upbringing of Jonathan Edwards with a strong Christian vision of life. My emphasis is not the Puritan bringing, but their strong emphasis on the Christian life. Edwards' life is worth emulating, for it teaches us that leaving a godly legacy to our children should be our ultimate goal as Christian parents. You may build a house, but have you taught him the fear of God? Admittedly, the faith and godliness of children is ultimately the work of the Holy Spirit. But I equally believe that God often uses the influence of parents to make a great impact on their children. Let me turn to the Puritan's view of marriage and family life. The Puritans set before their married partners the idea of wholehearted mutual love. They set before them. They gaze at it and they try to live according to it. Richard Buster, one of the greatest Puritans, arguably the greatest Puritan, enumerates, he mentions them one by one, the common duty of a husband and wife. So we will take this one, one after the other. But I want us to pay attention to the projection now. Number one, to be entirely to love each other and avoid all things that tend to quench the love. Entirely to love each other and avoid all things that tend to quench the love. Whatever you say or do that has a tendency to harm their relationship, they are saying avoid it. If your spouse has expressed a dislike for an action or an inaction, please try and don't harm the marriage. Man can say, may yet. The man is your husband. The lady is your wife. Try and avoid anything that can harm the marriage. Number two, to dwell together and enjoy each other and faithfully join as helpers in the education of their children. Faithfully join as helpers in the education of their children, the government of the family, the the government of the, the managing of the home and the management of their worldly business so that whatever business your spouse does, the lady should be interested in. They have to look at what they do for a living. And then they have to manage the home together and they have to be mindful of the education. No wonder where they lived, we have all the great universities established there. It is now that we are having some new ones come up. But the Harvards and the Cambridges, you find them at where the Puritans lived. To dwell together, especially those of us who are called to attend to ministry. Now God has called us to do his work. Those of mommy lives there, the man too also lives at the other end. She comes as and when necessary because she thinks that she is married that man. We have to dwell together. Dwell together. I wouldn't emphasize too much on that. The assignment that we have to snatch souls from hell is the greatest assignment. This job is the greatest job. We are saving souls. And we want you to commit everything to it. Try and commit it. See. I like this one. But it is not the last one. 
It shocked me the first time I, I met it. Especially to be helpers of each other's salvation. Hmm? So we married to go and help the spouse's salvation. To stir up each other to faith, love and obedience, and good works. To warn and help each other against sin and all temptations. To join in God's worship in the family and in private. To prepare each other for the approach of death. And to comfort each other in the hopes of eternal life. What a reason to get involved in marriage. I'm going to help my wife's salvation. She has to help myself. It doesn't give room for complaints at all. And then beating. Because what you think she did wrong, you have to help her to come up and be strong as a Christian to make heaven. Great point. D, to avoid all dissensions and to bear with those infirmities in each other which cannot be cured. This one is quite something. Avoid and bear with. Avoid dissensions, quarreling, contentions, Strong disagreement it says avoid in the marriage. Avoid. Now, some of us, we just don't cry. We, we get, we, we don't, we decide not to talk for weeks. The of mommy follows the husband to church like that. When they see the members, then she will speed up. Yeah. Well, whom are you deceiving? How can you and your husband, the pastor, not be talking for two weeks and you are still preaching to who? These people, they are saying that even quarreling, we have to try to avoid it. Strong disagreement, we have to try and then manage that one, avoid it. Bear with those infirmities which cannot be cured. When I was growing up as a Christian, when I, uh, as a pastor, I should say, sometimes people come to me and the sort of challenges they bring, they leave and it becomes a burden on me. So there are certain things that we have to dwell with. Some infirmities like physical weakness. When your wife is now sick, treat her well. If she is bedridden and she's suffering from anything, treat her well. When you married her, she was not in that condition. Not at all. There are certain things that we might, which cannot be cured. Ailments. Then those things that those days really bothered me was habits that is difficult for the other to cure. Simple things like the picking of the nose. Picking nose. It's a challenge that somebody brought. Picking nose. Maka, ka, 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 ka. Maka, ka, 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 ka. Then the lady was there. When she was going to respond, the hand went to the nose. You see, some of these things you may never know how long. Maybe it is an ancestral picking nose. Now, when you marry her, you marry all of them. It takes, it takes time. When, when we went to our first station, I realized that there were a lot of mosquitoes. And me too, I was afraid of them because normally by a bite of mosquito, I'm down. But I realized that in as much as I was telling mama to be shutting the door, she, she would not do it. So I get, I get so worried. When we blew a foot, I'll go and bang, bang. Then, one of those days, I followed her to their house in Kumasi. I realized that there were trap doors at all the doors. So when you move, the door will close. See, when you move, the trap door itself, because of the spring, will close. And now I want to use two weeks to, <laughs> to reorganize her. So when I saw it, 
In front of the trap door, I repented. Yeah. You see, there are certain habits that you need to dwell with. What of if your husband snores and you are a light sleeper? I've had this case before. I mean, to me, me burn my breath. But when I come home, I, I, I just don't understand. I've been telling, sleep here, sleep there. But you see, even if on the first day you had that problem, for better, for worse, snoring is not, is not, is not the behavior. What is important, this one is you and her in the room. What is important is how she exhibits you on the outside. Put a premium on that because there are certain habits that we have to dwell with. Shall we stand for a moment of prayer? Just a moment of prayer. Just lift up your hands. We have been disturbing one another and God is a witness. Shall we pray together? I mean pray. Try not to speak in tongues if you can. Pray with your understanding so that you know that today I prayed about this. May the Lord forgive us all our trespasses and may he pardon us for this too. In Jesus' name, amen. Please have your seat. Number five, to keep conjugal chastity and fidelity and to avoid all unseemly and immodest conduct with another. So far as that relationship between you and your husband is concerned, you have to avoid all unseemly and immodest conduct I saw with my eyes an action of a certain sophomore, I mean, I was surprised. She saw this elder, and she, she, was, she hugged the elder, and then she was jumping at the back of the elder. I said, ah, we are grown, said, eh, she said, now listen, this is what I saw with my naked eyes. I've seen another person too, said, elder, now if, can't you give us anything today? And she was going to put the hand in the man's pocket. See, we have always to manage, especially the men. Women, manage yourself well. You heard Apostle uh, J. Quartin. He said, you see that Apostle too can, but can. <laughs> well, I don't want to use the English, but but is enough. Mm -hmm. Which may stir up jealousy and yet to avoid all jealousy, which is unjust. Can you project that, please? The E. Shall we read together? Ready, go. To keep conjugal unfidelity and avoid all unseemly and immodest conduct with another, which may stir up jealousy. And yet to avoid all jealousy, which is unjust. So there are certain jealousy that is unjust. Some are justifiable. And so try and avoid things that will make your spouse be suspicious of you. Try. The WhatsApp messages, the test messages, testing somebody's wife around 10 p.m. Why? Say the woman's leader. If you need the woman's leader, one of the best ways to be doing that is to always be calling the woman through the husband. Yeah. yeah. Try. You call the husband that I want your wife to come and do this. Don't be dealing directly with the woman's leader all the time, especially in text messages. If you, can you come now? There's a visitor here. Then the next time, can you come soon? Please run. Then a the man said, yesterday it was, can you come now? Today, can you come soon? And that's why I ran. We, we have had cause to dismiss pastors because it was the spouses who gave us the test messages. 
one of them, the young man interacted with the pastor for 25 minutes, saying that my wife said you have done this. If you have not done it, please, you let us know. So that if you have done it, please let us know. We will come and beg mama. And the man will say, you see, uh, you see, you see, you see, 25 minutes, you see. Hmm. If somebody is trying to put this thing on you and you are a pastor, don't say, you see, you see, attack it. I went to Kumasi two years or so. And then when we closed, I saw this lady lurking around. Then when I was going to my car, she followed me. And she actually called me Eric. And that name, Eric, is a unique name because those who, who knew me, they call me Eric. Eric, Eric, Eric. So when she said, Bra Eric, especially Bra Eric, I turned and I looked at her. And he said, don't you remember me? I said, I just, oh. I said, oh. Then she mentioned her name. Then she said, don't you remember that you have two children with me? Hey, 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 don't be afraid, don't be afraid. <laughs> two children with me? So said, unkai me. They said, where? They said, oh, we were living around Asafo. Then I said, oh, right. Because Asafo, maintain a hoda. Yeah. Maintain a hoda. That when she said that there was this pastor, I said, pastor, come. Listen to what this woman is saying. Mommy, what's she saying? Then she repeated it. I said, Asafo, who is this woman? Then Asafo took her away. And then she went to interrogate her. The following day, when I was coming to meet the pastors and wives, I brought this story. And then the pastor was trying to say that, oh, please, don't say it, don't say it, was giving me some sign. Mami, kawachina wahankasa, ube kwa kwa kase, wuna oye, sister, nuhuwe juma anyesa. I mean, when these things attack them. Mima utu anka migina ha. I mean, but we have people like this. Then later on, they said that she has some, some mentor. But our mentor, we a demonic mentor. Yeah. It has to be cast out. So some jealousy is not justifiable, especially the women. You don't have to be unnecessarily jealous because your pastor, your, your husband also takes care of the women in the church. So be careful. Then only we are cast out in our essay, be careful. But when men do not carry themselves well, their wives keep suspecting them. So let's take Proverbs 6, and I'll take my last test. Proverbs 6, verse 30 to 35. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his hunger when he is starving. Yet, if he is caught, he must pay sevenfold though it costs him all the worth of his house. But the man who commits adultery has no sense. Whoever does so destroys himself. Blows and disgrace are his lot, and his shame will never be wiped away. For jealousy arouses a husband's fury, and he will show no mercy when he takes revenge. He will not accept any compensation. He will refuse a bribe, however great it is. Let us carry ourselves well and avoid unseemly behavior and things that can arouse jealousy. I'll put a comma here. God willing, I'll continue tomorrow. Thank you very much.